<laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, can we scoot forward? <laughs> um, all, all of our uh, middle school, well, most all of our middle schoolers and high schoolers are away at retreat this week. And so our front section is uh, a little light. So if you wouldn't mind just scooting forward a little bit, we'll make this a little more cozy. Yes, I have uh, successfully uh, jettisoned two of my three children to retreat. So it's been a far, but all, but uh, my nephew and niece are visiting this weekend. So I lost, I, I got rid of two, but then I gained two more. So I'm breaking even. Um, but it's uh, I, I we did hear from them, uh, uh, and every everybody made it up there okay. And then uh, Pastor Eddie told us that we're going on the policy of no news is good news. So when we, if we don't hear anything from them, that means that retreat is going just fine. So we'll continue to uh, to pray for them as we um, we go through the weekend. They'll be coming back tomorrow. Um, so uh, we have to keep keep them in our prayers for safe travel back here. Um, will, you, will you pray with me this morning? <clears throat> Lord, Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for... Um, this morning, we thank you for um, bringing us together and uh, uh, and giving us a place where we can uh, gather together and worship. And we pray that you would uh, you would be honored by our gathering this morning. Um, but also that uh, for those of us that are not here, the, all of our middle schoolers and high schoolers that are away at retreat, along with the counselors and and the speaker. Um, that you would uh, you would work uh, work the way that only you can um, at their retreat in their hearts and in their minds this weekend. Um, that they would grow closer as a community. That they would um, uh, that they would grow closer to you as a result of all that uh, all that you have done for them. And also, they would pray that you would bring them back safely. Uh, uh, tomorrow afternoon. Just thank you uh, for everything that you give us, and we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Hello. This is this is progress because normally she's running away from me. So. All right, will you stand and uh, sing these songs and worship with me, please? mountains and the sea your river runs with love for me and I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free I'm happy to be in the truth and I will daily lift my hands for I will always sing of when your love came down I could sing of your sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever sing from the beginning and over the mountains and the sea over the mountains and the sea your river runs with love Open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of Sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. And oh, I feel like dancing. It's foolishness, I know. 
when the world has seen the light, they will dance with joy like we're dancing now. I could sing of your love forever. 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 I could sing. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of. I could sing of your love forever. How deep. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make the wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns His face away. As wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders, ashamed. I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give it. This I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm 
accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and you rose again amazing love how can it be that you my king would die for me amazing love I know it's true it's my joy to honor you in all I do I honor you let's sing I'm forgiven again I'm forgiven because you were forsaken accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and you rose again amazing love how can it be that you my king would die for for me amazing love I know it's true and it's my joy to honor you in all I do I honor you you are my Jesus, you are my King. Jesus, you are my King. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love. joy to honor you amazing love amazing love how can it be that you my king would die for me amazing love I know it's true and it's my joy to honor you in all I do, I honor you. In all I do, I honor you. Well, let us pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, we, we come before you to honor you. Indeed, it is our desire because there's just so much love that you have demonstrated uh, to show us um, how much your Father and your, yourself have loved us, how, how, how far you have gone in order uh, to demonstrate your love uh, to save us from our sins. Father, it is, in, it is true that um, we can never... <laughs> We can never say thank you enough. We can never sing of your love enough because all who we are, you know, and who, who we are today and who we will be tomorrow and in the future, it all depends on your love. And Father, we're grateful uh, that you have given us this knowledge and you have also given us this faith to trust in your love knowing that um, 
You saved us from our sins. You, 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 you save us. You demonstrate your love while we're still sinners. You demonstrate your love while we're still your enemies. You demonstrate your love while we're still rebelled against you, while we don't, while we still didn't want to have anything to do with you. And yet, you send your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, to die on the cross, bearing our sins, and pay the price of our sin, so that we, our sins might be forgiven, that we can stand before you freely without fear, without fear of your, 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 your future judgment, and free to, to, uh, to, to serve you, and free to serve other people, and free to be ourselves the way that you intended us to be. So, Father, this morning as we con- continue to pray, we, we want to um, ask that you would, uh, you would demonstrate, you, you would expand that, that love for us, through us, to people around us and to this um, larger society in which so much chaos and brokenness is everywhere. Father, this morning we pray especially uh, for Mike and Jenny. We pray for their, their newborn baby. We know that there's much challenge ahead, and yet we know that your love must be sufficient for them. I pray that in their hearts, uh, they, they, they would understand that perhaps this is the time that they, they can experience even deeper, uh, even in wider and higher of your love for them. Help us to be able to, to find ways to reach out. Help us to, to, to also to find way to, to see what we can do. And likewise, I also lift up uh, Casey before your throne that you would be with their family in this special time of challenge, in this special time of difficult and, and needs. We pray that your love will be, it will be clearly demonstrated and lavished upon them. And Father, we also ask that um, you, you would be with the, um, the, the youth and the counselors um, throughout this weekend's retreat, that they too uh, would have a sense of refreshed um, love uh, from you and that they will love deeply with one another, to one another. Father, again, so this morning, we thank you for bringing us to the, to, uh, together uh, as your people uh, to remember your love for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please be seated, and, um, and please take this opportunity to just uh, greet one another as we dismiss the children to the uh, Sunday school class. And as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and, and Nate also mentioned that our high school, uh, junior high and high schoolers, are about 35 of them are on the retreat and with, together with counselors. And uh, I also imagine that perhaps um, some of the tired parents would take this opportunity to take a break, right, from you know, taking care of their, their youth. And so I, I do also uh, uh, realize that and, and I pray that they will be refreshed from their break as well. Now this morning, I'm um, we'll just go right into my topic. Um, my topic is, um, in all things, love. And I appreciate uh, Nate, uh, b- b- select all the songs, uh, help us to re- remember uh, to think about the love of God. And uh, it's a very familiar passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the, the love chapter, right? Many of you probably can, can memorize it. Um, But uh, let's just read uh, this passage first. This is from one of the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to the believers uh, in Corinth. So uh, uh, chapter 13, verse 1. Uh, I will read the whole chapter, but uh, I'm not going to talk about the whole chapter today, right? If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, 
And if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. I'm sorry. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Now, I will first make a few um, comments regarding the context of this chapter. And then I will examine three areas uh, concerning this passage. One is the, the biblical nature of love. And when we talk about love, um, what, what, what exactly are we talking about? And then the utter necessity of love. And finally, the dynamic actions of love. So these are the three uh, aspects that I'm going to examine from this passage. Uh, first, you know, looking at the context. From the, the larger context, I can say this, love is the criteria of genuine Christ-like spirituality. Uh, we, we do have spiritual life. You know, we're, we have the Holy Spirit in us. Well, we read the Holy Bibles and we read God's word and we share with one another um, not only physical uh, benefits, we, but also uh, the, you know, what the Lord is doing in our spiritual life as well. But then Christ-likeness or Christ-like spirituality can, the, the best measurement for that is love. Now, some people would, would think that chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians is a uh, sort of a stand-alone um, poem or a hymn. And that's why in many of the weddings you attended, perhaps, uh, we use this passage as the, the spirit, the, as a scripture reading, right? And, uh, and in many wedding messages that you heard probably also uh, uh, surround uh, you know, using these uh, particular passage, especially about love is patient, love is kind, and love never fails, and such and such, right? Um, I'm sure you, you've heard that, you've experienced that. And when you do that, is taking this particular chapter out of context, right? Um, but if you look closely at the larger context, of this particular chapter, then you'll realize that love has everything to do with how a believer ought to conduct his life. Love must be behind, behind everything. Love must be the guiding principle in all things. And so, so what I'm saying is that, again, love is the criteria of genuine Christ-like spirituality. Now, why do I say that? If we look at the larger context, in the previous chapter, chapter 12, Paul started out by saying, now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. So starting from there, he goes on to, to speak about the origins of spiritual gifts and where do they come from. And, and he, he, he gives some examples of spiritual gifts and more importantly, the purpose uh, for which the spiritual gifts are given by the Holy Spirit to each believer. 
stressing the point of for the common good, right? That all the spiritual gifts, every, every gift that you and I have are for the common good, is for the community, is to build up the community. So in a sense, in, in a larger, um, a, in a wider understanding of this is that we, how we interact with one another, how we uh, conduct our lives, especially in the faith community, has, is, is what Paul is talking about here. You know, at the end of the chapter 12, then he says, but eagerly desire the greater gifts, and now I will show you the most excellent way. And from there, he launched into chapter 13 to, the, to all those verses that we have read. And if you remember, at the end of chapter 13, and he says, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And then chapter 14, he continued to start, he started with this, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. And of course, he continued to talk about prophecy, talking about, you know, the gifts of, uh, the gifts in, in um, presenting the word of God. But then the idea of this whole content, you know, if you look at um, what is what he talked about before chapter 13 and at the end of chapter 14 and in the beginning of chapter 14, then you realize that Paul is, is clearly talking about how, um, how love it must be the, 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 the foundation, how love must be the, a, a guiding principle of how a Christian exercises his or her spiritual gifts and in, in a broader sense, how he and she conduct his life, especially in the Christian community. So it is clear um, from the larger context that Paul is teaching about um, the, the manifestation of the Spirit, the, the Holy the, all the examples that he, he gives are not, uh, is not a sort of exhausted list of every possible spiritual gifts. He's giving examples of how the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit will work through uh, believers for the common good to build up the church community. And so every conduct and every day, uh, every day-to-day -day, uh, lives of a Christian is, it's in a sense, a manifestation of the Spirit's work. And here in, in this whole letter, um, and Paul wrote to the, the believers in Corinth, his concern for them and also for us is that love needs to be developed in Christians as an attitude and a habitual practice for everyday life. I say it again, if you read through the whole letter, 1 Corinthians, and as well as 2 Corinthians, Paul's concern for the believers at that time, and, and by extension to you and I, is that love needs to be developed in a Christian as an attitude and habitual practice for everyday life. What, what he's saying then is that on account of the love of God demonstrated in Christ Jesus, love is the underlying motivating principle and needs to be demonstrated in words and deeds in a believer's life. On account of the love of God demonstrated in Christ Jesus, love is the underlying motivating principle and needs to be demonstrated in words and deeds in a believer's life. Now, if love is so essential, then we must come to a clear understanding of the nature of love, right? So what is the nature of love? Now, nowadays, uh, in, our, in our Western culture, love is a pretty confusing word. The idea of love is, is pretty, uh, um, it, 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 it's being frustrated in some sense. We, we tend to associate the idea of love with emotions, with our inner desires, and even with sexual intimacy. But God is the author of love, and not us. So in, a matter, in, in the matters of love and life, trusting his word, rather than our fickle hearts will lead us to flourishing and health. So we'll look at how, 
what, how does the Bible, you know, what does the Bible say about love? And we can get some sense on the nature of love by Paul's choice of the Greek word for love. Now, he, he used the word agape. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this idea. But the word agape is rooted in the notion of care, regard, and respect for others and for the well-being of others. It's totally outward looking, not inward looking. In a, in, according to the, the Greek lexicon, the word agape denotes a love that is spontaneous, unmotivated, creative, and free. Free in the sense of Christians are not to love only those whom they find attractive or who share their values or they have the similar social status or even uh, they share the same theology. Christians are not only to love these kind of people. Christians are free to love. People are not like them. People have different theological convictions. Because what motivates Christians to love is a prior experience of the love of Christ. Love in the, in the agape sense is not a reciprocal return to those who are kind to us or to those who have demonstrated their affection to us. And so agape in Paul's uses creates value rather than responding to value. So agape is active, actively creating values in others, not, a way, not passively responding to the values I receive from others. Love, in a sense, it, it's it, love of God, right? As I said here, the, the agape is it's a, it's motivated it's a love motivated by prior experience of, experience of the love of Christ. The love of God is essentially God's, according to this definition, free, sovereign grace that sets value upon his people. God creates value in his people. God is not responding to our love for him. It's the other way around, right? Love is God's benevolent concern for humankind. Therefore, we as Christians are to respect and care for those who may not seem attractive or like us in their culture, gender, race, or concerns, because they are either fellow believers or human beings on whom God has set his love. You see, all religions have some idea of the importance of love. But what's unique in Christian understanding is that the Bible stresses the importance of love because God has revealed that he is love. God revealed in the Bible that he is love. He himself is love. Love is both what God is and what he has done. God always acts in love. And, and we see this clearly in the letter of First John, he, where he says in chapter 4, verses 8 to 12, he says, Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. And he continued to say, uh, to write in verse, uh, verses 15 to 16, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they are in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. This is the biblical idea that God revealed himself as love. And he demonstrated his love through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. And we are the free recipients of this love. 
And as, a, as an outcome, we ought to demonstrate that love. You know, many of you probably heard of this uh, Karl Barth, right? This is a well-known theologian in the last century. Um, you know, after, after writing thousands of pages in his, in his book called Church Dogmatics, he arrived in this very simple definition of God. In his big volumes about church dogmatics, he, he, he writes that God is the one who loves. Very simple, one-sentence definition of who God is. God is the one who loves. Now, there is a story about him. Uh, it went on, it, no one can really uh, you know, validate whether it is true or not, but it is an interesting story about him. You know, back in uh, 1962, he spoke at Rockefeller, uh, Rockefeller Chapel in, on the campus of University of Chicago. Um, and many people reported that during the, the Q&A section, a student asked Karl Barth, you know, if he could summarize his theology in a single sentence. And this is what's reported. Uh, the story goes that in part, Karl Barth responded by saying, in the words of a song I learned at my mother's knee, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. This is the sentence that he summarized his theology. Now, again, no one can say for sure whether this is historically true, right? But this story has been uh, going around for a long, long time and widely spread. But then it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good way of summarizing a very important topic. And then I think this is one of the most profound biblical and theological truth. That Jesus loves me. The Bible reviews that God is love, and he demonstrated his love in the love of Christ. So the first thing we, we come to note is in, in this title is that the, uh, the biblical nature of love. And then think of the words agape. Think of the, 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 the directions. Um, think of the, the free, unmotivated nature of this love. And secondly, the utter necessity of love. And here, we look at the first three verses of chapter 13. Verse 1, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have, no, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Here, Paul used a, uh, a sort of a hypothetical scenario. Suppose it were the case that, you know, I spoke not only human tongues, but also with angelic tongues, but had not love. I would have become like what? A resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. So if I can speak not only English, Chinese, Koreans, Japanese, uh, Russian, whatever, if I can speak all the language of human being, of the human society, whatever, and I can also speak languages that's given by the angel, but that only those who are gifted with interpretation can understand what I was saying. If I, if I can do that, but if, I've, if I do that without love, I'm just a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal, which is a, a combination of um, um, instruments that only amplify noise. In, in, the, in, in the, the idea of a, a gong, a resounding gong, gong is basically something that they uses to reverberate a, a noise. It, it does not have a particular uh, a definitive tune or particular um, melodic quality to it. It's just something to amplify sound. A clanging symbol, symbol is, is the, uh, a similar idea. And you two flat piece of metal uh, just you know, clashing one another and just creating noise. Just creating uh, something that does, doesn't really, 
is not really ple uh, pleasing. And so using these two uh, illust uh, elements that combined a metaphor, uh, basically it's, it's, it uh, depicts a, a tongue speaker. If it's this people, this person can speak all kinds of tongues, but have very little, li very little love for others, this person is just producing self-importance, resounding, intrusive decibels, <laughs> which amount to little more than that. It's not creating music. It's not creating melody. It's not creating enjoyable effect. The second verse, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a face that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Prophecy or supposed knowledge received or exercised without love merely minister to a fleeting self-importance. In point of fact, without love, Paul says, I'm in nothing. Now, moving mountains um, was, was a familiar uh, uh, metaphor for overcoming difficulties, right? And every kind of faith sufficient to remove mountains still cannot compensate for the lack of love. No matter how, how great, you know, how, how intelligent you are, how s strong you are, how powerful you are in, in physical, in your, in your will, on, in your mental c capacity, you can overcome all the, the, the difficulties in the world. But if you've done it without love, you, you're still not overcoming the most difficult part of your life. Even one who has the gift of such outstanding, robust confidence in the weight of God without love is still nothing. In verse 3, it says, If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. The logic of this verse is pretty similar to the logic of verse 2. Verse 2 states that, that however gifted a Christian may be without love, he or she is utterly nothing. And verse 3 states that who, whatever personal sacrifices a Christian makes, giving away all material possession to feed the poor, even self-sacrifice in death, if all this is done without love, it counts for nothing. So with this threefold assertion that apart from love, spiritual gifts amount to nothing, we realize that no matter what profound wisdom, what prophetic insight a, a Christian has, or however massive his or her self-sacrifice is, without love, all counts for nothing. No matter how hard a Christian strives for achievement in life, no matter how pious a life a Christian tries to live, if done without love, all counts for nothing. If the Spirit has not poured God's love into our hearts until it overflows, all these fantastic achievements are like drawing water with fish nets, only end up with nothing. So all of this to say that love is utterly necessary in every Christian's doing. Now, we know this, is, we, 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 we come to grip a little bit about the nature of love, and we know it is necessary for everything a Christian does. How does this person demonstrate love? How does the, the love demonstrate it? And now we see verses 4 to 7. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. In, in these few verses, Paul uses verbs 
not nouns, not adjectives. He used verbs to bring out the dynamic, active, and effective nature of this indispensable love. He, used, he uses 15 verbs to indicate 15 actions, seven positive and eight negative. Seven actions one should take and eight actions one should avoid in order to love well. Eugene Peterson, in his, um, the message, uh, in his own paraphrased translation, he, he says it this way. Um, okay. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. Doesn't have a swelled head. Doesn't force itself on others. It is isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others gravel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always look for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. And, but, but I like uh, the other translation better. I like this one better. Love waits patiently. Love shows kindness. Love does not burn with envy, does not brag. It is not inflated with its own importance. It does not behave with ill-mannered impropriety. It is not preoccupied with the interests of the self does not become exasperated into anger, does not keep a reckoning up of evil, love does not take pleasure at wrongdoing, but joyfully celebrates truth. It never try, tires of support, never loses faith, never exhausts hope, never gives up. And I will not discuss all these verbs in detail, um, but as you read off the list, re as you read off all these action verbs, you realize that um, there's a lot of food for thought and self-reflection, right? You can spend hours just on this list. And to, to reflect for yourself, you know, do I show kindness to those who criticize me? Do I... Am I ready to show kindness to those who I normally don't like or those who don't like me? In what area do I tend to envy others? Do I have any envy in this life? Right? Do I envy others when they go on vacation? Do, do I envy others when their kids all goes to Harvard or whatever, right? Now, do I think a great deal of my self-importance? I think all the time, think I'm, I'm important. I'm, 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 I'm a big shot. I, I am important. No, this, this whole place is, can, cannot do without me. I'm indispensable. Am I preoccupied with my self-interest? You know, we, we can engage in these pro profound soul-searching just by contemplating over this list. Put yourself into the list and just reflect on yourself. I, I think hours upon hours, and I think it will do you good. It will do, my, do me good. But suffice it to say that love is a verb. And, and this is a common phrase too. Love is a verb. Uh, there are songs about this. There are books written about this, right? Love is a verb. But then when love is a verb, it requires an object, right? The love, the, the action needs to be, you know, performed upon an object. In the Bible, sinners are objects of God's love. 
Sinners are, God's, are objects of, of Christ's love. Christians see God's love in sending his son to die on the cross to save sinners. As Paul tells us that God demonstrates it, his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 eight. And earlier we read from 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, said, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You know, so Christians are to be known by the fact that they love God and others with their whole being because we are the objects of God's love. Jesus also told his disciples, a new command I give you, love one another. <clears throat> As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So again, love is best seen in actions and, and in most cases is to be identified with our compassion and commitment to those around us regardless of their virtue. We love because God first loved us, right? In that sense, our loving attitudes and behaviors are in fact a reflection of God's love. Jesus said that only two commands are needed to govern our lives. There are only two commands that are needed to govern our lives the greatest commandment, right? Love God with your whole being and to love our neighbors. There's only two commandments to govern our whole lives. And if such love is demonstrated, the Bible also tells us that all the laws and prophets are fulfilled. Love is that, that the energy that put everything together and fulfilled all the requirements, all the teachings in the Bible. And we, this, and we, we read this from Romans chapter 13. It said, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not co covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does, not harm, does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And that's why I said earlier, I believe that love is the underlying principle, the underlying motivating principle that needs to be demonstrated through words and deeds in a Christian's life. Because genuine love will find ways to express itself. Genuine love expresses itself not for one's own self, but out of concern for others' well-being. Love is a verb. A verb requires an action, and actions are people outside of us. Actions are done to our neighbors. I know it is difficult to live this way. It is counterintuitive. It is totally counterintuitive to think about others before think about myself. To love those who are not, in our own sense, not lovable. It can only be done through God's outpouring of love on us. I also realize it is easy to say this, but it's difficult to live out but unless we first immerse ourselves in God's love. So but we can pray without ceasing that Jesus' self-giving love would penetrate us. As we pray, as we pray that, as we allow ourselves to be penetrated by Jesus' self-giving sacrificial love, as we immerse ourselves in the love of God, as we trust in, in his words that we're, we should be able and we will be able step by step 
to demonstrate this love, to act out this kind of a love. Not too long ago, I read something that deeply moving, written by Henri Nouwen, a Catholic priest and theologian. Um, he wrote in his sabbatical journal, an entry dated December 26, 1995, that's the year before his death. He wrote, I quote, this afternoon I wrote many postcards. While writing, I experienced a deep love for all the friends I was writing to. My heart was full of gratitude and affection, and I wish I could embrace each of my friends and let them know how much they mean to me and how much I miss them. I felt my whole being, body, mind, and spirit yearning to give and receive love without condition, without fear, without reservation. Why should I ever think or say something that is not love? Why should I ever hold a grudge, feel hatred or jealousy, act suspiciously? Why not always give and forgive, encourage and empower, give thanks and offer praise? Why not? End quote. And I ask myself, and I also ask you, why not? Why not love? Why not pursue a life of love? Why not in all things love? What is stopping you from doing that? Come what may, there's no substitute for love. Loving God, loving to worship God, loving to worship God with his people, loving to hear God's word and to feast on his goodness at his table, loving the hope of Christ's return, loving our neighbor. There's no substitute for love. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your demonstration of love in Jesus. I pray that you would help us to love as he did, selflessly, sacrificially, and consistently, so others may know of your love through our actions. Heavenly Father, teach us to notice the others and value them just as you do. I know you loved us when we were not lovable and redeemed us when we were not worthy. Help us to take our eyes off ourselves and see others as you see them. Lord, we, we humble ourselves before you, recognize, recognizing your boundless power to love, the incredible need for love in the lives of those around me, us, in our limited ability to love. I pray that you will pour out your Holy Spirit in us, into our lives, and fill us with the power to love as you do always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you please rise and uh, sing these songs in response with me, please? <laughs> thought of us before the world began to breathe. You knew our names before we came to be. You saw the very day we fall away from you. How desperately we need to be redeemed. Lord Jesus, Come lead us, we're desperate for your touch. Oh, great and mighty one, with what desire we come that you would reign there. 
that you would reign in us. We're offering up our lives, a living sacrifice, that you would reign, that you would reign in us. Search our hearts and purify our lives. We need your perfect love. We need your discipline. We're lost unless you guide us with your light. Lord Jesus. our lives, a living sacrifice, that you would reign, that you would reign in us. We cry out for your life to refine us, cry out for your love to define that again. We cry out for your life to refine us. Cry out for your love to define us. Cry out for your mercy to keep us blameless until you return. Desire we come that you would reign, that you would reign in us. We're offering up our lives, a living sacrifice that you would reign, that you would reign in us. So oh, great and mighty one, with what desire we come that you. Us. We're offering up our lives, a living sacrifice, that you would reign, that you would reign in us, that you would reign, that you would reign in us, that you would reign, that you every song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, 
there is no one like you there is none besides you open up my eyes in wonder and show of every song. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. build my life and I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation I will put my Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Sing it one more time. I will build my life. And I will. Upon your love, it is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. Let us bow for the benediction. <clears throat> May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the deep love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon all God's children to help us to build their lives upon the, the love of God and give glory to the one true God in heaven and on earth from now forevermore. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> uh, just quickly, um, take a few moments to just welcome all of you again, uh, especially our guests, um, to, to be here uh, to serve, uh, to, to worship the Lord together.
Um, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, first of all, today, um, all the junior high and the high school are having a combined Sunday school class on, at E203. Uh, for next week, week on, next Sunday will be the, uh, the last day to register for a uh, uh, Easter baptism. And so if any one of you still or any of your children still thinking about getting baptized on Easter Sunday, uh, you need to be registered for the baptism class um, no, no later than next Sunday. <clears throat> Another thing that I want to mention is um, this coming weekend, uh, on Saturday on, and next Sunday, we have a special uh, visitors from Taiwan, uh, a pastor, Pastor Stephen Sung. And he is um, uh, one of the applicants to, um, to our search for a, 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 a pastors in our Chinese ministry. Um, so he will be here um, this coming Friday evening and then stay for Saturday and Sunday and go back to Taiwan on Monday. Uh, so on Saturdays, then he will meet with uh, our search committee, with uh, the, the pastoral council. And uh, in, the Saturday, in Saturday afternoon, from four to six, there is a sort of a, a getting to know each other time, uh, primarily for the Chinese congregation. Uh, but, but if you're comfortable with Chinese, uh, or if you feel like asking a, 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 a few questions to, to know him better, uh, you're more than welcome to, to join on Saturday afternoon, four to six, uh, most likely in the B building. On Sunday morning, then he will preach here. Um, he will preach both in the English service as well as in, in the Chinese service. So that's the um, was, that was a special guest for. But then uh, let me just emphasize, th this is just a, ch a chance for him to know us and for us to know him. Um, it's, not, it's not that um, once this meeting, this weekend is over, then you, are, uh, you will be asked to, to vote uh, whether to invite him or not. Just a chance to, to get to know each other. Okay, uh, with that, you are all dismissed from this uh, service. If you, uh, okay, we're right on time. That's great. <laughs> right. Have a good week. Go in peace.